Hi, everyone. This is Jason Burek of Wall Street for Main Street. Today, I want to do something a little bit different. I've been talking with Lee Justo. He was doing interviews with Wall Street Silver for a while. He's a financial professional. He's worked different jobs in the financial industry for the last couple decades. And we're going to talk about some interesting topics today. Our tentative name right now for the new show, we're going to try to do this once or twice a month, is Finance Unspun. So, Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it's good to be here. Uh neglected to mention my my current channel which is risk on youtube and uh there will be a link in the uh, description of this uh conversation so i'm excited to be here today i think there's a lot to talk about uh you know we're, we're facing somewhat of a global food crisis and there's just so many aspects to kind of pick apart and look at uh would you agree oh yeah and i let you plug your own channel so <laughs> <laughs> it's i do to- appreciate that but for my listeners who are not familiar with you and your background, just maybe go into your background a little bit first before we start talking about this week's topic. Sure. No, no worries. Um, I, I was on the Wall Street Silver channel. You, you can find me on, uh, on those old videos uh, for just about a year. Uh, then I, I founded my own channel, Risk. Uh, my, professionally, I was a trader uh, down on Wall Street uh, during the dot-com boom. From that, I went into the commercial insurance space and, and focused uh, pretty intensively in the private equity world. Uh, so, so that's my finance background. Uh, and I've just been a follower of the markets since the late 1990s when I started reading just everything I could in this space. That brought me into precious metals and understanding the whole fiat currency system. So let's uh, let's get into what's going on in the world today. Uh, you know, we have... Uh, the issues in Ukraine, and I don't know if people are familiar, but in 1932 to 1933, uh, Stalin uh, confiscated all the farms in Ukraine, and like 14 million people starved during that time, and they called it the Hol- Holodomor. Uh, and we're facing an even worse crisis now because the Ukraine is one of the largest suppliers of food in the world. Uh, I think it's almost 400 million people globally depend on the Ukraine for some aspect of their food. So I, I think we're looking at maybe a, a much more significant impact in today's day and age. Well, we have a food and energy crisis. So these problems are structural. These problems are long term. There mm-hmm. were people warning about these problems far before the pandemic, but the pandemic has really brought a lot of these things to light. It's exacerbated. It's brought to attention the food and energy problems. And then on top of the supply chain breakdowns that we've had from politicians and bureaucrats, and really, Lee, I think a lot of these problems are from politicians, bureaucrats, and central bankers. We have decades of bad policies, especially in energy, because food production is very closely tied to energy. A lot of energy is required to grow food, to produce calories, to transport it to the grocery store. All of these things have compounded now really to the perfect storm in the last 18 to 24 months. I I agree with you. I know the the supply chain words have been thrown around for the past year, but, you know, it's really just a somewhat of a fancy term or or a spin on what everyday business world is. Just taking farming, for example, you know, the farmers are relying on fertilizer that fertilizer has to be created. Uh, it's produced, uh, a lot of it has actually been produced in Russia, and there's been just severe inflation. Uh, potash, Ukraine produces something like 40% of the world's supply of potash. Potash is used for potassium and fertilizer. Um, it, it's just one thing after another, but the farmer has to get the fertilizer. He has to plow the fields. He's plowing the fields with a diesel tractor, So right there, you have petrochemicals on both ends. And then once he produces his goods, it has to be trucked to market, diesel fuel again. And then it's brought home, petroleum and the cars. So energy is just absolutely intertwined with with the food. And the people in the European Union, the United Kingdom, they've had the brunt of the energy and electricity crisis. As bad as the stagflation is here and the shrinkflation is here in the United States, it's even worse in many other countries, especially in the European Union, because they were so reliant on Russian oil, Russian natural gas, 
And that natural gas and the other parts in the natural gas, I think natural gas liquids, other inputs from that are needed in order to make fertilizer and for transportation fuel, for heating and electricity costs, all these other things. So their costs for electricity are up enormously. Their costs for mm -hmm. fertilizers mm -hmm. are up enormously. Yes, things are bad in the US. We have bad stagflation, double digit stagflation, way higher than the phony government economic data from the changing propaganda index or CPLI. But this food and energy crisis is heavily intertwined and it goes back to bad energy policy in so many of these governments. You know, speaking of that, what are your thoughts on Poland and Germany and, and Russia demanding being paid in rubles for the energy that they supply to those countries? I mean, I think this is going to be absolutely devastating to Germany, which is uh, basically Europe's manufacturing base. Yeah, the input costs are up enormously in Germany. They have insane amounts of stagflation. I think the producer price index in Germany is up the highest since 1974 or something like that, Post -war, the highest since post-World War II era. Just really, I mean, the manufacturers aren't going to be able to produce, but demand for some of these items is going to start to drop if prices keep rising. I mean, unless you are an affluent consumer and you benefited from all this asset price inflation in stocks, bonds, real estate, the average middle-class person, working-class person who has a lower income job or a lot of debt, student loan debt or other types of debt, or a high mortgage payment with these mortgage interest rates spiking, these extra costs are going to really hurt your consumer discretionary budgets. You know, it's funny you say that. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, interview Jim Rogers a couple of times. And probably the best thing I've ever heard anyone say is the best cure for high prices is high prices. And the best cure for low prices is low prices. And that really gets to the heart of what you're saying. Well, Rick Rule used to say that all the time, too. But the problem is if we have politicians, bureaucrats, central bankers changing the rules all the time, the free market, so capitalism in the free market, it won't be allowed to solve these problems. So there are yeah, legitimate absolutely. so there are legitimate problems in energy and that spills over into food and other and other different industries and supply chains. So like the US has an a uranium enrichment problem right now. That's mm -hmm. so it's not necessarily uranium mine supply, it's the enrichment problem. But then you have to get all these licenses approved from the Department of Energy and other and other uh, government agencies. And that could take a decade or more. And then your permit costs are many millions of dollars. So this is not something that capitalism and the free markets can easily fix by, say, moving the uranium price to $100, $150 a pound. Well, you still need those permits approved. You still need those licenses approved. And how quickly is government going to allow this to happen? And that's- you know, really Jason. I, I had listened to your uh, interview with Cuppy last week, and he, he made this point very, very clearly. Uh, you know, it's no, nothing is simply just turned back on. You have oh, to yeah. go for the permits. You have to train people. And, and that's oh. going to be th true throughout the whole supply chain. Well, what, what people are missing now, and we wanted to talk about this with food and energy, is the big diesel price spike. And then also what we're hearing out of the oil patch with mm -hmm. the lack of steel pipe. I mean- it's not being talked about in the mainstream financial media, at least not yet. You had the comments from the CEO of Halliburton. They have all these contracts to drill more oil and natural gas wells, but they're out of the materials. They're running out of the materials. They're running out of the steel pipe needed because a lot of the steel pipe, if you go and listen to that interview with Cuppy, hedge fund manager Cuppy, he talks about how a lot of the steel pipe for the oil and gas industry that's used to case these completed wells. So after these oil and natural gas wells are drilled by a Schlumberger or a Halliburton, they're cemented and then they're cased with steel pipe. Well, now we're out of steel pipe. <laughs> right. So, so you can't finish the well. So for lower gas, gasoline prices, we need more oil and natural gas production. We need oil refineries to increase production of gasoline. These things are not going to happen in the supply chain because there's supply chain problems and in the Russia, excuse me, and then the Russia sanctions. Yeah, which uh, which is basically cutting off energy to Europe right now. Which I, and it goes back to manufacturing. They're not going to be able to manufacture parts, and it it's just this this loop, this broken loop that's causing things to to go from bad to worse. And I I don't I don't see anything changing anytime soon. I mean, here in the United States, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Union Pacific. They've been uh, they've requested a lot of their customers to reduce their loads, specifically CF Industries, which supplies most of the farmers in the country with fertilizer. 
So if we're looking at a 20% reduction in fertilizer shipments in the spring time when everyone's planting, we're, we're looking at the price of nitri- nitrogen has gone, I think, from 200 a ton to 1,000 a ton. I mean, it, just everything is just piling on top of each other. And fertilizer and the inputs are easier to get here in the United States, but other countries like Brazil and others, they're not having as easy access to get these. Even if they could pay a much higher price, they can't necessarily still get all the inputs. It's not so simple with all the rules, regulations, red tape from imports and exports that the politicians and the bureaucrats have put in place because of the pandemic. Jason, how do you play this as an investor? I think you have to have some cash because there's going to be a lot of volatility. So there's going to be buying opportunities rather than just chasing fertilizer stocks or chasing liquefied natural gas stocks up. There's going to be buying opportunities like in the share price where you just look at consolidation in the charts. Um, I think there's, and as as I discussed with a hedge fund manager, Cuppy, last week, there is a new normal, a much higher price for a new normal for all of these commodities. Now, unfortunately, we have not had a higher price for yet, much higher prices yet for gold and silver, but that's because of paper price manipulation, but with mm-hmm. rising costs for the miners. I mean, this diesel spike, it's not priced in yet because the miners announced their Q1 2022 earnings already, which were good, right. but, which were good by the way. So despite higher energy input costs, a lot of these gold miners still had good earnings. However, the Q2 numbers, the Q3, Q4, because these miners, off, most of them either do not hedge at all their energy input costs, or they only hedge a fraction of their energy input costs with diesel or electricity. The diesel spike that we've had in the last 12 months, and for those of you that are not familiar, the diesel prices here in the US, and I'm sure it's this way in other countries, they're up $2 a gallon. So the diesel prices are up enormously in just the last 12 months. I think the diesel price, Lee, you were telling me about this since you drive a diesel car, what you were I do, and I have to tell you, I was, I was driving today, and I saw one gas station six ninety nine a gallon for diesel. Wow. Now, now keep in mind, just two or three years ago, I was paying like two two fifty a gallon, and it's not uncommon to see five fifty or six dollars a gallon right now. It's just it's mind blowing how much it's gone up. And a diesel engine, for those of you that are not familiar, our listeners who are not familiar, a diesel engine is more efficient. So. I've heard from my friends who own diesel cars or trucks in the past that they were getting better mileage per gallon with their diesel and their fuel costs for many, many years for diesel were lower than gasoline costs. But now because of the Russia sanctions, and I think a lot of diesel was being imported from Russia. So with these U.S. sanctions, that's hurting it as well. You haven't had U.S. refiners increase diesel capacity to offset the Russia sanctions yet. So again, this is not a free market or capitalism problem. This Definitely. is governments, this yep. is politicians, bureaucrats, and also central bankers that are creating these enormous distortions. And it's not so easy for the private sector to figure out the rules, regulations, red tape, especially if the rules, Lee, are going to keep changing. Oh, it's always a moving target. And, you know, another, another thing that you talked about in your, your uh, discussion with Cuppy last week was the discussion on D.C. with a windfall profits tax just to add more complexity to everything. So now you have to just predict how much money you're going to be making. And if you make too much, you're going to get punished. It just makes no sense. But the oil industry actually lost a lot of money for, I think, six out of the last eight to 10 years. So out of the last decade, the oil industry, I think, only made money in six of those years. And the shale oil bubble was increasing oil production. And a lot of people think that that was profitable. It wasn't. So Mm -hmm. it actually wasn't. It subsidized cheap oil and cheap gasoline for the U.S. and allowed the U.S. to start exporting oil to other countries. But it wasn't done efficiently. It wasn't done for free cash flow. There wasn't profits for a lot of those oil companies. And... Now, like they're still on the supply side and we have this narrative now in the on financial uh, Twitter or FinTwit. The narrative is that central bankers are going to end the commodities rally, excuse me, end the commodities bull market end inflation. They're going to fight inflation. We have the European Central Bank. I think the Bank of England has already done it. The Federal Reserve Bank is supposed to, at least a lot of people think that they're going to increase interest rates 
tw at least twice in the next month or so. And then there are going to be additional rate increases, but in excuse me, but increasing interest rates two, three, four times, yes, it might hurt some marginal buyers of commodities, some marginal demand, but for the food and energy problem with these big, big problems on the supply side, I mean, the average person does not want to reduce their standard of living that much. They will pay more, especially if their income hasn't collapsed. So these food and energy problems are not going away, regardless of what happens with central bankers um, trying to fight inflation, increasing interest rates, um, potentially reducing their balance sheet. So I think that's something that's important because, Lee, I know you've been talking with people in these industries. I've been speaking over the last couple of weeks. I just spoke uh, yesterday with a trucker talking about like his rapidly rising diesel costs, how his spot freight rates are down too. So his costs are rising and what he can charge customers is down. And then I was speaking with people in the oil industry telling me like, look, these rate increases aren't going to fix any of the problems in our industry. No, definitely not. I mean, there's, there's systemic structural issues that pretty much every industry is facing right now uh you know, shipping rates have gone through the roof and they're they're only going to get worse with this spike in diesel because all those ships run on diesel fuel for the most part <clears throat> and, and like you're looking at the equity markets they're getting killed because everyone's talking about the fed raising rates so it's it's really a perfect storm all around and you asked me earlier in the interview about ways to potentially play this as an investor. I think people have to be cautious with some of the gold miners because some of them are not going to be, especially if they're open pit miners that have to use a lot of diesel with those giant earth mover trucks, like those Caterpillar one ton or two ton trucks that use a giant amount. I think they only get about one or two miles per gallon. Diesel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So they're moving over a thousand pounds of rock to the crusher, to the conveyor belt at these giant open pit mines, they're burning through diesel 24-7, 365. And a lot of these mining companies do not hedge their oil costs for one year, two years, three years in advance because it's too expensive from a capital intensive standpoint to pay for all that diesel up front. If they did hedge a certain amount of their energy costs or, or diesel, it's only a fraction of the amount. And now it's not priced into the mining stocks yet, at least their earnings because the Q1 earnings were good. But Q2, Q3, Q4, going forward, unless we have higher gold and silver prices to offset that rapid increase in diesel costs, and then also we have outside of the United States, we have big increases in electricity costs, labor costs. The other thing that most people aren't thinking of is we're looking over the last like three years, the cost to build a new mine is up at least 50%, I would say. It depends on the country. It could be even more than 50%. The cost for materials costs, cost of capital, all these different costs to build a new mine. So for a copper and gold mine, one of these enormous um, low grade open pit mines, the cost to build the mine are going to be enormous going forward as well. So the mining industry, the industry that's gonna be hurt by what we talked about with higher food prices, especially, uh, but also with like higher energy prices and the diesel price spike, you're looking at the trucker industry, the food industry is going to get hit with the diesel price because the transportation costs to the grocery store for all this food, moving it back and forth in the supply chain. And then the miners, that's what a lot of people have not figured out yet are these open pit miners that use an enormous amount of diesel and electricity throughout their entire mining and milling operations. They use an insane amount of energy. You know, and to broaden this discussion out away from just the miners, we're looking at basically a, an epic ec economic contraction across the board and that i think is going to put pressure on governments to raise capital and the way they're going to be doing that is they're going to be squeezing companies and, and people like us with, with taxes and and all sorts of restrictions so I, I think everyone's business is going to get tougher as, as things progress well that's part of the stagflate tax life thesis so yeah. even if the narrative on financial Twitter, even if the government economic data in the consumer price index or the inflation rate, even if those start to fall, it's going to be divorced from reality. Because again, I have not seen any evidence that inflation is going down. So yes, the dollar index is rallying. The dollar index, I haven't checked it today, but it was above 103 the last time I looked at it. Yes, it the still Fed, is. 
Okay, so yes, the dollar index is rallying. Yes, the Fed probably will hike interest rates another two times, but that's already priced in. Yes, mortgage rates are higher, but these food and energy problems, if we could wrap up what Lee and I have spoken about for the last 20 something minutes, the food and energy problems are not going away. So some marginal demand may fall, but my sources, and I've spoken with some hedge fund sources that have really good contacts in China, even better than Kyle Bass, China's running very, very low on food if they're not out of food. And this excuse of the new variant, this lockdown was used to cover up massive food shortages for staple crops, for wheat, soybeans, corn in China. And also from what I've heard from speaking with sources, the African swine flu problems that China had in 2019, those have actually not gotten better. So the whole hmm. narrative, and I was criticized heavily about this for talking about it in 2019 with the African swine flu, how according to my sources, over 70% of China's pork population was killed wow. in the African swine flu. So they were rushing all over the globe to the US, the European Union, anywhere they could find new pork, new sources of pork and other types of meat, that those problems with the African swine flu are still not fixed. So this food problem in China, China is going to have to buy, Emperor Xi just announced a new infrastructure package. I think they're going to spend over $2 trillion on more commodities purchases. Now, I don't know, normally the way China buys, they don't buy everything right away. They tend to be kind of like, um, they tend to wait for, for dips or crashes with commodity prices. And if they've driven things up too quickly, then they cool off. They take a break from buying certain commodities, say they won't buy any for a while, or they have some of their uh, shell companies dump some metals onto the market, or they could get caught with their pants down like on the LME where like a, a Chinese hedge fund and a Chinese bank all try to short the nickel price because they were greedy. <laughs> <laughs> and in the uh, London Metals Exchange, which is owned by a Chinese company now, well, a uh, de facto Chinese Communist Party entity is uh, now the main owner of the London Metals Exchange. Uh, they just changed the rules. There will be more short squeezes like that with with nickel and zinc and others, but I don't think the the longs and the retail shareholders, excuse me, and retail investors are going to benefit from them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I, th I think it comes down to just protect yourself as best as you can. I mean, I know myself. I actually for the first time in years, started a garden this year just because of the food prices are going through the roof. And there's other ways around that too, uh, besides investing. So you could buy like a vacuum sealer, you could buy your meat ahead of time, you buy a, a second or third freezer, you can buy a used freezer and repair it, you can vacuum seal your meat. There's, uh, You can negotiate with a local farmer, you can try to buy your beef outside of the grocery store. There's ways around this. Yeah, yeah if, you if definitely you have to be more out. creative. Yeah, if you plan things out. So, but normally though, you're going to have to pay more upfront. Mm -hmm. But th but then you're thinking like a Costco shopper, then who's actually going to use the items you buy? <laughs> <laughs> which which you should only be buying stuff you're going to use. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, it's easier said than done. So that it, is true. Because like people go in there and then they impulsively buy, and that's how a lot of these stores <laughs> make so much money. So yep. if you buy a bunch of stuff and you're not going to use it, it's not smart. But if you buy a bunch of meat and you vacuum seal it. And then you put it, some of it in the freezer and you reuse it. I mean, there's ways to, to rehydrate the meat. So there's ways to keep it fresh or somewhat fresh. No doubt about it. And there's, there's plenty of uh, information out there on the web to, to learn these things. So I, I think this has been a great discussion, Jason. I uh, look forward to the next time we do this. Yeah, me too. And uh, feel free to plug your YouTube channel again. And if our listeners want to follow you on social media. Okay. Um, I'm not too active in social media, but I, I do have my YouTube channel, which is Risk, and the link will be in the description below. So have a great weekend, everyone. And for now, if you like the name of the show, comment below. But for now, we're going with the name Finance Unspun.